A select group of affluent bankers and investors gathered for dinner at an exclusive private club to hear a business proposition for a revolutionary new invention. A telephone receiver fitted to a horn stood ready on the dining room table. From this horn, the sound of the future would flood the room. The pure, rounded tones of electrical music. A single pair of telephone wires transmitted Handel's Largo as it was being performed on the Telharmonia, 35 miles away. Before leaving the table, the awestruck businessmen would commit more than one hundred thousand dollars. Sweet and clear over the wires. It was only a down payment to finance a second, larger telharmonium and purchase a license to operate the instrument in New York. Twenty years before the advent of radio, cable broadcasting had become a reality. It's pure music, and it seems to spring from nothing. It's just a pair of wires. Thaddeus Cahill was a young lawyer and an inventor of mechanisms for pianos and typewriters, living in Washington D.C. He was one of many who had experimented with transmitting music over the telephone system, but the sound had proven too thin and weak to fill a room. Electrical amplification was unknown. Then, in 1893, he was struck by a grand and radical idea. Why not build up complex musical tones directly from a set of electrical generators? It would be the perfect music machine. It would possess all the strengths of every instrument, with the defects of none. Cahill envisioned transmitting music from what he called a central station to tens of thousands of places at once over a network of telephone lines. During the late 1890s, he slowly built by hand a small version of this astounding instrument. Completed, it was to weigh 14,000 pounds. Nothing like it had ever been seen or heard before. He showed the telharmonium to George Westinghouse and the Scottish scientist Lord Kelvin, who was delighted. One of the greatest accomplishments of the brain of man. Cahill began to look for money to build a larger version. He demonstrated it for Oscar T. Crosby, a prominent Washington capitalist and a well-known world explorer. Crosby hungrily predicted enormous profits on the scale of the telephones. He decided to back Cahill financially and take control of the enterprise. When the two of them succeeded in transmitting electrical music to the Maryland Club, potential investors plainly saw the fortune to be made in sending long-distance music everywhere, to hotels and clubs, to restaurants and theaters. Possibly high class. Positively hair-raising because of its novelty. In the summer of 1902, Crosby sent Cahill to Holyoke, Massachusetts, to build the second telharmonium. The busy mill town had scores of machine factories. Cahill, with his brothers George and Arthur, set up a workshop in the Cabot Street Mill. As the second telharmonium was nearing completion, Thaddeus Cahill hired Edwin Hall Pierce and two other local musicians to play the new instrument. They began to develop various sound qualities, boldly hoping to duplicate the instruments of the orchestra. Pierce's son James was 10 years old when the great machine was completed in 1906. He could remember listening to the telharmonium. Just what the sound of it was, as I recall, it was something resembling an organ, a pipe organ. Of course, they could sound like various different instruments. It was it must have been at least 40 or 50 yeah. feet long. Cutting the gears, <laughs> cutting the teeth in these wheels and things like that. I can remember seeing them do that in the shop there where they were working. The main frame of the instrument was 60 feet long, and the mighty giant weighed 200 tons. Ten switchboard panels were jammed with nearly 2,000 switches. Thaddeus Cahill had spent $200,000 to build his central station full size. 
The first performances were given at the Cabot Street Mill in Holyoke and transmitted to the Grand Ballroom of the Hotel Hamilton, half a mile away. The entire ballroom was filled with sound, despite the absence of electronic amplification, because the output of a single generator on the central station was as great as 14,000 watts. The guests were enthralled. Extraordinary and delightful. Sometimes, however, the wires delivered a distorted and annoying sound. The tones would start with a click, as though a metal hammer were striking a string. All the notes were now created in little explosive puffs. In the summer of 1906, the Telharmonium was dismantled and transported to New York. The instrument was reassembled and installed a few blocks south of Times Square in the Broadway building. The alternators and switchboards were set up in the basement. The keyboards were housed in a new auditorium constructed on the ground floor. The Broadway building stood opposite the Metropolitan Opera House and the glittering Casino Theater. This expensive stretch of Broadway was known as the Rialto, the heart of the theater district and a mecca for the cream of fashionable high society. The Telharmonium was a performer's nightmare come true. It was the most hair-raisingly complicated instrument to play in all the history of music. Usually, two musicians played at one time. One would play the bass line and accompanying chords, set his own timbre control switches, and set some of his partners. He would also operate a swell pedal and a separate dynamic manual to control the overall volume. The other musician played the melody and treble harmonies. He constantly stretched his reach to create just intonation intervals and to span four keyboard banks. It was a torment to move around the keyboards, since black and white keys alternated one for one. He would also operate his own swell pedal, along with the remainder of the timbre control switches. The musicians needed to adjust a master tuning control when the drive motor began to slow down and the pitch drifted. They could always phone for help. The first preview concert in New York was presented in September of 1906. Before the concert, a crowd of 900 guests filed into the machinery rooms in the basement to marvel at the transformers, switchboards, and dynamos. During the concert, technical inadequacies were evident. The bass was thin and the treble had a dull sound. It was ironic. The massive instrument seemed best suited to small pieces of a gentle and unassuming character. Like a church organ, much softer and sweeter. Fashionable restaurants were springing up all over New York, a diversion for the new industrial rich. Many of the finest restaurants were in prominent hotels, among them the Victoria, the Plaza, and the Waldorf Astoria. Huge menus would come to feature more than 500 items. Some establishments boasted four orchestras, each with 30 musicians. Restaurant performers ranked among the best and highest paid players Europe could offer. The combined salaries of New York restaurant musicians exceeded a million dollars in one year. Replacing them with his new service was the goal of Oscar T. Crosby and his New York Electric Music Company. Absolutely perfect and beautiful music by the best musicians upon the only perfect musical instrument.